Okay. Um, so if you want to find out what happens, I do. Which we all do here. Uh, you should watch on the 28th and the the full broadcast. <laughs> it was a real cliffhanger. Right. Um, Happy ending, though. Spoiler alert. Yeah. <laughs> if you've been awake in the state of Arizona for the last six months, you know how it happened. How it ended. Um, so I want to first introduce our panelists and then get to some fun questions um, and then take some questions from the audience as well. Um, so we have three fantastic panelists here today. So first we have uh, the PI, um, the fearless leader of the mission, Dante Loretta. We have the mission implementation senior systems engineer, um, Anjani Pollitt. And the producer of the film that we just watched up until the critical moment, uh, John Booth. <laughs> okay, so I, I feel like I have this, the same question for all three of you, which is, um, how hard has this experience been? <laughs> and yeah. when did you start? I mean, we know you started a long time ago. Mm -hmm. You mean watching this movie? <laughs> It's pretty hard to watch yourself age 20 years in like an hour, right? So <laughs> We considered that as a subtitle, actually. <laughs> no, but seriously, it's been uh, an unbelievable adventure. I, when I look back and I think of, you know, 30-year-old Dante getting those phone calls from Mike Drake, and it didn't seem real. I, I say it seemed like magic. Lockheed Martin was in there, and they said, Dante, we need you to pick an asteroid and we'll bring samples back to you to study in your laboratory. And I was like, no way. <laughs> Did you immediately say Bennu? That's no, 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 we didn't pick Bennu for another year and a half or so. Okay. Yep. It is really interesting, actually, to see all of uh, my colleagues looking a little bit younger and a little less stressed on the, <laughs> on the screen there. So I've been part of the mission for, for seven years which you know, feels like a, a long time, big part of my career, but it's nowhere near the 20 years that Dante has been doing this. So, I mean, it's been overall just an amazing experience. Yes, stressful, uh, losing sleep sometimes, but just incredible. I think just, just to give Anjani some props in terms of what she does, we brought her in. She was the planning, senior planning engineer for the Mars High Rise camera. So she was the interface between the scientists who have all these great, sometimes crazy things we want, and she worked with the instrument teams and the spacecraft team and the flight dynamics team to get the spacecraft to the spot we wanted it to collect the images or the spectra. And she's so good at her job, she's still with us helping us figure out how the scientists in the laboratories talk to the curation team so that we get the samples that we need. So she's the interface, she's the translator between the science and the engineering so we can get what we need to get done and tell it to the engineers in a way they know what they need to do. So thank you, Anjani, it's been great. And I'll just say, yeah, one of the things I do is herd. I like to say I herd scientists. <laughs> and that's not easy. Yeah. Uh, so for me, I actually was born here, left, came back, graduated here, spent my first 10 years in television here, and then lived in four other places and remembered that Tucson was a great place to retire. So I came back in 2013, and I only caught two thirds of the mission. Um, but I oversaw uh, photographers, editors, producers who made parts of everything you're going to see, that you'll see in that documentary. It goes back 20 years, and um, so when they called me in June and said, "Do you think you can put this all together into a documentary?" I th thought, "Sure." And the only new thing we shot was the interview with Dante. Everything you saw was a story that somebody else researched, produced. I took it, reordered it, put a new narrator, new music, and things like that on it. But the, there's a, the only thing I think we have similar is there's a giant team of people, just like Osiris Rex, giant team of people that worked really hard uh, just to get that together. So it was not difficult. It was a, definitely a joy. So one aspect of it, which actually it struck me right in the beginning of the piece, was um, the sample return was designed to like pop off of the spacecraft, and the spacecraft continues on, and now it's having this incredible extended mission, which will be equally exciting. 
Um, and I am curious if, um, like there were alternative ways to design it where, you know, the whole thing comes back and then you don't get an extended mission. And so was, was there, were you guys thinking that far ahead when you were kind of doing this basic design? We had that concept from day one in terms of a sample return capsule that would detach from the main vehicle and deliver the material to Earth because we were building on previous design, especially a mission NASA had flown called the Stardust mission, which used a very similar capsule and it flew through the coma of a comet and collected some small dust particles and returned those to Earth. So the, one of the earliest design decisions was we want to refly the Stardust capsule because it successfully landed on Earth and it was a known technology and that retired a fair bit of risk for us. And now you're working on the extended mission, correct? Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So OSIRIS APEX, we kept the OSIRIS part and then added APEX, which stands for Apophis Explorer is the extended mission for OSIRIS-REx. So after the spacecraft launched or dropped off the sample return capsule, 20 minutes later it executed a burn and that started OSIRIS-APEX. And that is a mission to visit and rendezvous with asteroid Apophis in 2029. Right after Apophis makes a close approach to the Earth, it'll be 10 times closer than the moon it is an amazing opportunity to have an asteroid pass so close to Earth. It will, its orbit will change dramatically from that close encounter. We think the length of its day will change or its rotation state will change from that encounter, but it's unknown exactly how much. And that encounter with Earth could induce changes on its surface like landslides. And so we're sending OSIRIS APEX there to characterize that, to see what effect did Earth have on this asteroid. And it is a potentially hazardous asteroid like asteroid Bennu. And so it is really important to understand these objects and to characterize its orbit into the future. And yes, AZPM is already covering it. That was gonna be my next question. I was gonna say, John, are you working until 2029? We actually have, I mean, the, one of the, the hard parts about doing something like this is what you, it's a horrible phrase, but my wife has heard me say it a million times. At some point, you have to kill your babies. Mm -hmm. And what that means is you love it all and you have to get it down to 58 minutes. What do you cut? So we have a, a long, an extended interview with Danny, the, PI of the new mission we Who have interviewed. Who you see in some of those old, yeah. that old footage. She started as a undergrad, right? Yeah, so the principal investigator of Osiris Apex is Professor Daniela Della Justina. I met her in 2005 when she was 17 years old, a freshman here at the University of Arizona, and she took my one credit seminar on asteroids. <laughs> and we, you know, I just saw a lot of myself and her, very similar backgrounds. We're kind of like big brother, little sister now, so we needle each other a lot, uh, try to outdo each other scientifically. It's a very good rivalry, and it really is the culmination of Mike Drake's vision that you think about the future and the next generation, and I couldn't have been more proud to hand the reins of the spacecraft over to Anjani and Danny and all the young people that grew up on OSIRIS-REx. They're taking it into the future for this amazing extended mission. And Danny's actually, oh, I'm sorry. Dante's providing uh, counseling on what it's like to watch yourself age over oh, 20 man. years. Yeah, no, she's in the hot seat now. I get phone calls all the time, and I was like, and, this is, and so this is you the big job. Sorry. Right? <laughs> yeah. um, so one question that I had, there was a part where I feel like you're being a little bit mean to Canada. Like, they're doing the best that they can. I, I don't know what Wait till you hear to from ASU, too. <laughs> You know, they're like, I, I, and so I actually sort of have two questions that that part brought up, which is, um, did you guys have a backup plan if they didn't deliver? And why is the launch date like set in stone? Okay, I'll start with the second part of that question. So the launch date is set by the time period when Earth orbit and Bennu's orbit crosses. And so if, you, if we missed the launch date in September of 2016, we would wait one year for the Earth to go around the sun and we would launch in 2017. And that costs hundreds of millions of dollars to slip something like that. And we are very uh, conscientious of the fact that we're spending US taxpayer dollars and that we are responsible stewards of that money. So we want, you had to make your launch window. Uh, the laser, <laughs> excuse me, laser altimeter was an international contribution 
And because it, it was out of our control, the funding especially, but the whole engineering process was outside of our purview, we were ready to fly without them. It would have degraded the mission substantially, but we still could have done it. It would have been a lot harder. As we know, Anjani, without that OLA data, it was really critical. But they were literally about to get canceled. Uh, I was gonna take them off the program because they were 18 months late in getting their money from the Canadian Space Agency. And the, that day, I had a cancellation review. They were literally running through the halls of Canadian Parliament, getting the signatures for authorization for the budget. And right before I put the gavel down and said, you're canceled, they said, we got it. We've got the money. And we're going to be able to start building this instrument. And I was just like, this is too dramatic. Yeah. yeah you know? like, that sounds like it was made for yeah. TV. It's, yes, exactly. <laughs> And, and I wanted them to fly so bad because it is a great instrument. And they are our friends. And it wasn't the team's fault. That was the most frustrating part. They just, it was the bureaucracy above them getting the money free so they could start their work. Okay, that's so frustrating. And I'll just add, I mean, as Dante mentioned, the, the OLA data from the laser altimeter was absolutely critical for finding a safe sample site on asteroid Bennu. So very, we're very thankful that we, we have OLA on the spacecraft. Yeah, all that 3D data you see of the asteroid, that's all real data collected by that laser altimeter. We're not simulating any of that. We actually got to the point where I, I put up the word animation or OCAM footage because uh. you couldn't tell the difference. Right. It was so crystal clear. So for, from your perspective was the fact that there was like so much data and kind of archival footage, did that complicate how you were going to tell this story? It made it really simple, actually. I mean, you still have to tell a story. You still have to come up with a way to take stuff that was produced for different, for news programs and uh, different music and different styles and make it look like a singular program. That was the biggest hurdle. And uh, uh, Andrew Brown, the, the executive producer of Arizona Illustrated, and I came up with the idea of, well, let's interview Dante looking back, but 12 days before the end so he can you know, be a little nervous. <laughs> Just a little. Um, and yeah, we did that interview, what, 12 days before it landed. So no, it, I mean, the most difficult part is you have to look at everything. You can put it in chronological order, but then how do you get from one place to the other? And so we, that's when you have to write. And fortunately, NASA's and Goddard's and everybody's graphics are so amazing. I'm sure, Dante, you were watching some of that going, oh yeah, that's one of the old ones. Uh -huh because some of them are really crunchy. Uh, but I basically created a, a, a string out and had some large black holes with you know music playing and I handed it over to somebody who is here tonight and deserves your applause, Nate Huffman, who edited the original Countdown to Launch, shot the majority of what you saw and edited this together and he filled all those black holes with images. Nate, we're, oh there he is. Thank you, Nate. So, so I have a um, a question that is both scientific and like from a um, like an artistic perspective. So, Osiris Rex flew by the Earth, and it took that picture of the Earth, which is all Earth, Earth from space is always a great shot, um, and it's in color, like you see the blue of the oceans and the brown of the land, um, and then all the pictures of Bennu, it's black and white, and so I'm curious, is that because Bennu is black and white? <laughs> is everything in space except for the Earth just black? It's Well, Bennu is absolutely dark, dark black, way darker than it looks because those cameras were designed, they're very fast cameras, and they let in a, a lot of light, and we stretch them to see the contrast variation. I have seen Bennu with my own eyes. By the way, if you would like to, on March 6th, we are debuting the Bennu sample at the Norville Gem and Mineral Museum here in Tucson. You can see it with your own eyes. Thank you. And it looks like a black hole. I mean, it, you see it sitting there in the containers in the curation laboratory in Houston, Texas, and you're like, it, it's the darkest thing I've ever seen. So yes, Bennu is really dark and black. That said, we had a special camera, one of the three cameras called the map cam that had color filters. So when we make a, like that great image of the earth, we take a red image, we take a green image, we take a blue, we also take an infrared image, and then we stack them into what's called an RGB image, a red, green, blue image. And that gives us 
color. And we have color images of Bennu, and you can stretch them, and Bennu really starts to look like a psychedelic <laughs> landscape. And it's important scientifically, but it's not what you would see with your eyes. So I have a couple of questions from the audience that, I, that I'm going to ask. So um, first, can you, can you guys talk a little bit about um, like cosmic chemistry and what that actually means in the context of like astrophysics and just general science? Yeah, I'm a cosmochemist by training. It's basically a subset of geochemistry. Geochemists look at the chemistry in geological systems. It could be fluid chemistry, rock chemistry, weathering systems, et cetera. And they use the chemical and mineralogical information to tell the story, right? Rocks, they remember. That's why we're so excited about them. They remember their formation, and we want to know that information, so we try to extract it from the rocks. Cosmochemists really started with the Apollo program, and Mike Drake and, and that generation looking at the lunar samples that the Apollo astronauts brought back to the Earth, which I'm excited to say the OSIRIS-REx samples are right next door in Houston, Texas at the Johnson Space Center, so we can go and look at the Apollo rocks uh, while we're waiting for something to happen in the OSIRIS-REx clean room. So it's a fantastic company that we keep there. So cosmochemistry is the study of rocks from outer space, basically. It, it, meteorites, lunar samples, we have meteorites from Mars, we have those comet dust samples that I mentioned, and trying to use that information to piece together how our solar system came into existence, how the planet Earth formed, and why the planets have such different climates and different environments and why the earth is so special uh, for being habitable. So that leads to what is by far the most popular audience question. Several people wrote this in. Um, what have you found? Give us the scoop. Yes. We want the inside track here. So the first, we promised that we would bring back 60 grams. We brought back 121.6 grams, so more than twice <laughs> what we said which is a huge windfall for the community. The rocks are very much what we hoped they would be. They're dominated by clay minerals, uh, particularly one called serpentine. If you are a gem and mineral person, you're probably very familiar with serpentine. It's often carved into beautiful statues and things like that. It's the kind of rock that forms at the mid-ocean ridge on Earth, where you have material from the mantle of our planet, which we would call ultramafic, very generally dry, and formed at high temperature, it hits water and these clays form. And other ancillary minerals like carbonates, which are the white crusts that grow around our faucets, where here in Tucson we have hard water, iron oxides, iron sulfides, and tons and tons of organic molecules in all shapes and sizes, very much going to help us try to unravel how organic chemistry changed in these aqueous environments and led to the building blocks of life. And by that I mean amino acids, like are in our proteins. In fact, we found a lot of amino acids that are used in biology to the point where we're thinking of making a Bennu protein bar uh, <laughs> that'll have the same amino acids that we find in the sample. And you'll get like 14 of the essential amino acids through this, through eating this asteroid simulant. Um, and hopefully it tastes okay, we'll see. It probably tastes very sulfury, but we'll, we'll give it a, a shot. Uh, and nu nucleic uh, nucleobases, the letters of our genetic code, look like they're coming from these asteroids. So the things that make cells, that make living organisms, the basic molecules, they were formed in outer space and delivered to our planet. So considering that you, you guys were perfectly on schedule, I was actually so impressed that it's like video footage from 2011 that's like, we're gonna return to Earth in September of 2023. You like hit it perfectly. Um, and collected twice as much of the sample, so was NASA like, here's a new mission. That's and what, what would yep. you what, what would you do next? Like, could can you sample Apophis? There's no more sample ability, right? No, we only had one sampler head and one sample return capsule, so we cannot sample Apophis. They However, should have thrown two on there. Just the original design had two. <laughs> it did. Yep. Oh. yep, that's funny. Yeah, scopes. Okay, come on. Why? D scopes. Yep. Yeah, Cost, mass, exactly. schedule. I mean, you talked about hitting schedule. One way you do that is by killing off your favorites. So <laughs> sometimes you have to make hard choices to make yeah. sure you hit that schedule mark. So I will add, though, even though we cannot sample asteroid Apophis, what we're going to do is something similar to the sampling event that happened on asteroid Bennu. We're going to send the spacecraft down close to the surface, a matter of meters above the surface, and blow the thrusters to then back away and disturb the surface. Oh, I love that. And so then we're going to 
you know, take pictures of what we did and use that to learn about the material properties of asteroid Apophis. So there's actually still that's, a lot we can do. That's still really good. It I'm, is. I'm yeah. excited for 2029. Do you need to worry about that same thing that was just at the end of where uh, the cliffhanger that the, <laughs> the program cut off at, where if you get too close and you like kind of tilt, then you hit the surface? Yeah, I mean, that is something we'll worry about. It's not, we don't have to worry as much. We're not as invested in getting down to a particular location because we're not looking for material that must fit in the sampler head or anything like that. So we have a little bit more flexibility, but of course you never know what we're going to see when we actually get to asteroid Apophis and what uh, challenges it'll throw our way. Um, so John, I want to know if, if everyone is a, um, really invested in finding out what happens and watches on the 28th. Um, are, did the crew get to go to like Houston and see them opening up the, the um, actual capsule? No, okay. but that's because, um, well, for several reasons. One, you can, it, they didn't open it for three months, but you know what I was thinking of when, when people would ask me about that, are they gonna get it open? I was like, okay, there's a scene in the documentary where Dante says, with the sideways Rex, we go slow, we take our time and we do it right. And so when I heard that it couldn't be open, I was like, yeah, it's, it's going to be open. We went to Houston. We shot, you'll see some, some scenes towards the end of, we, you know, we toured the, 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 the rooms that uh, the samples were going to be returned to and such. So we do look at that. Uh, but we had an air date, kind of like a launch date, but not quite as important. Um, and so we had to finish it. You know, we shot the last bit of it. Um, Brian Nelson, one of the producers for Arizona Illustrated, produced a piece on the sample return, which I then scavenged and put together as an ending. So we didn't have an ending in, uh, in uh, September, and we had to have it done by October. But there are parts about that process, mm -hmm. and you know, we had to le leave some things for a future producer to, to report. And by the way, Gene, I'm not available in 2029. <laughs> So, so actually, um, 2029 is just when Apophis has its closest approach to the Earth, but how long do you think that the spacecraft itself is going to keep working? Is it going to be a Voyager situation where like 40 years from now you guys are all still knows? working on this? Who knows? Uh, so we have enough fuel to get to asteroid Apophis and study it for about 18 months, but there's actually going to be more fuel left after that point. And so we'll just have to see how well the spacecraft is working. And there's the potential for proposing further extended missions. I think there's a third asteroid in that space. Oh, do you guys, yeah. do you know? We, we, do, we do not have a target after that. Is there a short list of targets? Some Does Dante do. actually yeah, know? Some of us do. <laughs> but, uh, I'm, how, I'm not going to say. Um, how, is, how do you actually select the target? Like, it was it? Um, a democratic process within the team? Did everyone vote? Like, how do you decide? Well, because this is an extended mission, uh, Osiris Apex, we had limited options. We had to find something we could, we had enough fuel to get to, just what was remaining from Osiris Rex. So we did have our flight dynamics team do an extensive search for possible asteroids, um, and even actually looking at Venus. Uh, but it was just very limited in terms of what we could actually get to. And it's actually that uh, close approach of Apophis to Earth that sort of facilitates us getting there. So um, Apophis was the best, most scientifically compelling target. And it really it really was an easy decision just because there, there weren't that many options. And actually, I'm going back to when we first heard of the, po the possibility of going to asteroid Apophis. This was during the middle of our sample site selection for OSIRIS-REx. I remember we were at Goddard Space Flight Center working on this. And we called into a meeting where our mission designer from Lockheed Martin presented to Dante guess what? We could actually go to asteroid Apophis after, after OSIRIS-REx. Do you remember that? Absolutely. I remember it. And I said, just go away. I don't want to think about this right now because I got to get this sample. Come back to me in 2020 uh, after we have the sample in hand. And that's what happened. But the flight dynamicists, they, they're the navigators of the solar system. They're like the mariners of old. They literally use the stars to figure out where the spacecraft is in the solar system relative to the sun and the earth and the asteroid. And it's magic to find these paths through the solar system. You have to do, what, four Earth gravity assists 
So we had to do one to get to Bennu. They have to do four to get to Apophis. And, and gravity assists are like those speed up boosts in video games, right? You hit the right spot in space and pew, you go flying off in a new direction using the gravitational field of, of a planet. And so four times uh, you have to pump the orbit of the spacecraft to get to asteroid Apophis. You can almost go anywhere if you're willing to wait long enough in the solar system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so our first gravity assist was when OSIRIS-REx dropped off the sample. We have three more, and another really interesting thing about OSIRIS APEX is we actually have six really close approaches to the sun on our way to asteroid Apophis. So this is going beyond the design limits of the spacecraft. We're actually just coming out of our first perihelion where we got the spacecraft down to 0.5 AU, half the distance from the sun to the Earth. And so the spacecraft heated up a lot. We are just getting data down. It looks good so far, but we'll be doing Nothing a melted. full character. Sorry. Nothing melted. Well, we'll, we'll see. We don't I have the full character. I assume you didn't point the, point the cameras at it, oh, no. at the sun. <laughs> Yeah, so the, the, the spacecraft team actually came up with a special attitude for the spacecraft that we called fig leaf to kind of, yeah, sensitive protect part, the right? sensitive parts of, of the spacecraft from the sun. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, so with all the discussion of orbital mechanics, one of the questions from the audience was about, you know, you, OSIRIS-REx traveled like a billion miles, some huge distance. Four billion. Four billion miles. Went to an asteroid, picked up some stuff, brought it back, did it all successfully, and yet it's still really hard for people to land on the moon. So could you guys comment on that? It's all really hard. Uh, <laughs> OSIRIS-REx was really hard, like really, really, really hard. Uh, and because we were so focused and dedicated, we had the right budget. I think a lot of these missions are, are leaner. Mm -hmm. You know, the, it's called the Commercial Lunar Payload Program. We've been try seeing all these uh, NASA-funded private spacecraft trying to land on the moon. And they take a lot of risk, right? The reason OSIRIS-REx was a billion dollars is because we were very, uh, risk averse. It was a low risk mission and the way you buy down risk is you test, you test, you test, you test, and you test and you drive out all the problems before you actually go into flying the spacecraft. So a lot of people spent a lot of time making sure everything worked right. We found lots of mistakes when we tested and we fixed them and we made sure that they didn't bring the spacecraft down. Yeah, but it was really, really hard. I mean, it required a huge team of people, all extremely dedicated, extremely smart, working really hard to solve all the challenges of OSIRIS-REx. So yeah, space is hard. Yeah, space is hard. Um, so one, uh, one question is actually about the power source. So some of NASA's missions like Cassini and some of the landers have used RTGs, which is a nuclear isotope power. Um, and so is OSIRIS-REx using that? What's its power? Uh, it's all the solar arrays. When you look at the spacecraft over there, you can see the two panels that stick out on either side. They're about um, two meters squared on each, uh, four square meters. And it's all solar, so everything is generated. There's batteries, so it charges batteries. There are a few times when we go out of the sun, we try not to do that very often with the spacecraft, and it's solely on battery power, uh, but it's, it's all solar powered spacecraft. And so that's actually a contrast with like Voyager, which is so far from the sun that uh, yes. It, yeah. It never generate enough power from solar panels. Solar arrays, you know, the, it drops off as what we call R squared. So if you go twice as far away from the sun, you get 25% of the power. So it, solar gets harder and harder if you're going to try to do a mission to Saturn or farther out, then solar gets really challenging. You have to have giant solar arrays to generate the same amount of power. But we're, we're really close to the sun th for most of the mission and the, the arrays worked great. Okay, so we have just a couple of minutes. Before the end, I wanna also say that someone um, lost a hearing aid, so if you lost one, it's at the front desk if you haven't already recovered it. Um, <laughs> in the last like two minutes, I, I really wanna know, so Dante, when it, was, it sort of started like your journey at the University of Arizona as a student, and you said how you were like working your way through, and you were a short order breakfast cook, so what's the best thing that you can cook for breakfast? <laughs> Well, definitely the breakfast special. I worked at a place called Mike's Place. Some of you might remember it if you've been in Tucson a long time. It was a dive bar just behind old Mama's Pizza off of Main Gate there. And it was 99 cents for two eggs, your choice, uh, potatoes and toast. So I could bang those out all day long. What a deal. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, the last quick question for everyone. If NASA gave you $1 billion, yep. where would you go next? Comet, sample return. 
Yeah. <laughs> We're, well, okay, it would, it's a lot more than a billion dollars, okay. but I want to do more sample return. Not for a billion, no, you're not Not for a billion, ten, ten billion, a cool ten billion. Or more. Yeah. John, that question's for you, too. Tahiti. <laughs> <laughs> Forever. Right. You got to bring a sample back. Well, let's give a big round of applause to our wonderful panel. And... Thank you so much for coming to spend your Saturday evening with us and for watching uh, the teaser of, of this excellent um, documentary. And I really encourage you all to check it out on the 28th and you can see how it ends. And it's really may, thrilling. Yeah, a couple of things. That, um, there'll be a couple panels at the Festival of Books that I'll be involved with on March 9th. One is for the Bennu 3D. I've seen some of you have that book that I did with Brian May and other team members. And I have a memoir coming out uh, it will be available for early sale at the book festival, but it's on sale March 19th called The Asteroid Hunter. Uh, and it goes through the whole journey with Mike and all the way back to the SETI uh, project and, and to the successful landing of the sample in September. So available everywhere fine books are sold. Please spread the word. Thank you.